Welcome to the Eat Well, Sleep Great, Run Far podcast. My name is Will Franz, and I'm here to help you go farther, faster, and longer without injuries, gut problems, or giving up your favorite foods. We are live. Sorry we're a little late. I clearly need to adjust the time of this. Um, I keep thinking I'm going to be able to get home from work quickly and do this, and it just doesn't. So I'm probably going to push this back about a half an hour, because 6.30 seems to be much more realistic after two, three straight weeks of failure on the time front. So let's get going. The theme for this one is nuance. Instead of explaining that, I'm actually just going to hop right into it because it will be much clearer with an example. On the note of too much too fast or starting training too quickly, I think one of the biggest things we can do to avoid problems down the line is to stop putting like obscure time caps on our goals that have no real basis in reality. Let me explain. One of the biggest reasons I see people fail at their goal is that they set some big goal, which I fully support. This should be clear because I signed up for a 50 mile race at a time when my longest run was 14 miles. And very honestly, I don't, I don't recommend that. For most people, I've been on a knife edge of injury for months. I've had to give up other types of training that I really enjoy. There has been a lot of sacrifice. And I knew that going in. I knew that I'd have to monitor injury. I knew all sorts of the risks that I wouldn't be able to do bench press as much as I want, that I was probably going to have to give up jujitsu at some point. And even then, I still chose a race to which like, I had a free entry because I volunteered earlier this year, and the ability to downgrade to a 50k in case training like went completely off the rails, right? Like, just in case. This is because while I think big goals are huge for motivation, I think we often get a little myopic in some of these pursuits. One of the biggest reasons I see people fail at whatever goal they're shooting for, is they set a big one, let's say run 50 miles in six months, and then instead of trusting a slow and steady approach, their brain panics. It says, oh crap, you just signed up to run 50 miles, and you better start skyrocketing your mileage, because there is no way you are going to get there in time. Which results in injury, and discouragement, and then you end up in a worse place than where you started. And it's not just in this like ultra running community, it's everybody. Like I see this a lot in person at the gym because motivation is a hell of a drug. Like a lot of people get motivated and they say, it's time now, and they get all ready to go and then they like tighten their workout clothes and they join a gym and they just start to beat the crap out of themselves five days a week. They go from seven days a week of like nothing but couch time to five days a week, at least an hour of beating the ever loving crap out of themselves. And then like two weeks down the line, they either say, you know what, this sucks if this is what it takes to get in shape, I'm just not going to do it. Or they get injured. And they got injured because they panicked about the goal they set and didn't like take in the wins along the way. When you set a goal of running 50 miles or running 100 miles or losing 50 pounds, it is hard. So like say you want to run a marathon in six months. Plenty of time for most people to finish a marathon. And if you're starting at zero, you almost certainly won't be fast in a year unless you have some like very genetic gifts. You might have to walk chunks of it, but you can finish a marathon in a year. Most people, at least. There are people on both ends of the spectrum, right? Like if you're, if you're sick, if you have bone issues, fine. Or if you're like a genetic specialty, then you might, your results may vary. But for most of us, Zero to 26 miles in a year is doable. You're not going to be great at it, but you'll be fine. And if we look at, I mean, six months 
is even realistic, right? And if you're starting at zero, great. So if we look at this like training split for six months even, right? The first six to eight weeks should be building up to a 5K, maybe 10K, but probably 5K. If you're training like three times per week and you have not done really anything in a while, build up to a 5K. Get your bones and muscles used to running. Practice your form. See if you can like not land super far out in front of yourself. See if you can get your running cadence moving towards 170 like steps per minute. Do some strength training along the way to help build up whatever deficiencies you might have and or are like fostering through the process. All that stuff that I preach all the time. Once you've built to a 5K in like a six to eight week span, you're gonna have a, such a solid foundation that you'll be able to stack mileage much, much faster. If anybody has been following me on 50 miler journey, that is exactly what I've been doing. I built the speed, I kind of <laughs> built up very slowly to weekly mileage, made it stable at somewhere like 30, 40, and we started to crank up a little bit with a little more speed training. And then right here, we were at a just volume dump where we did a training camp of 50 miles in three days, took a deload week for both life and health reasons, and now we're working towards a like 50k this weekend. And that is absurd <laughs> to look at from a couple weeks ago, but because the I set a foundation, and this is how we should all look at training. It doesn't have to be this like linear mileage progression, and that should, probably shouldn't be. You can add much more at the end of your block than you can at the beginning. But we have to set this foundation, especially when it comes to like musculoskeletal stuff. Because running is hard on your bones and muscles, and it takes time to build up in a way that you're not going to get stress fractures. Like, that is the enemy of runners, stress fractures. And they're super common because we go from nothing to a ton because we get too pumped on a goal and don't take wins along the way. We should have multiple goals. The big one that like kind of scares you a little bit and pushes you to do the big thing and then the ones along the way that are going to actually help you achieve that without going crazy in the process and it's just nuance right and this is one of the reasons that i like long form content videos and podcasts because of nuance because i tried to convey this topic on another like short form video platform the other week and received some frustrating feedback because it is a complicated topic to address. There is so much to this. I've been ranting for like eight and a half minutes. <laughs> There's just, and I, we have a ways to go. So many people come to running because they want to get in shape. And so many people come to ultra running through like the cult of Goggins, right? And I actually don't care what you think of them. I have mixed opinions, some good, some bad, but I see like a lot of people get injured because they read that book, Can't Hurt Me, had no training, decided to turn their life around, which is one of the reasons I really like him. He has like incentivized people to turn their life around. But they idolized a man that ran so far and so hard that he broke his feet, duct taped them back together, and gave himself such, severe, such a severe case of rhabdomyolysis that I'm honestly surprised he's not dead, as are most nurses who've read that book. Like, the mental fortitude is so respectable and there's so much to learn there but it is also hurt a lot of people because there's no context for it and it wasn't the point of the book the point of the book was him fixing his like mental struggles with the world it wasn't this is a training plan and i really appreciate that it has helped so much people like do something but it sets a rough foundation for a lot of people because most people started running because they were tired of being fat or something else, right? Like that's why I got into biking forever ago because I was tired of being fat. And running is a much cheaper way to, ver to do that, let me tell you, because bikes are expensive. So when that's how you're starting, 
you make huge gains by just working hard, period. You do hard work and you will see progress on that front, but it doesn't last forever. And it is a huge reason why I see people drop off. Very honestly, I know this is a weird thing to say here, but like, I don't care if you run ever. I care that you do something active that makes your life better. I've done so many things throughout my life and I've finally found a love of running and I hated it for so long. And that's because I finally stopped treating it like a punishment or a proving ground. Like one of my biggest associations with running before going on this journey was punishment for sports, right? Like a lot of us have this memory if you played sports and don't have a long history of running. Like I told this story to the challenge group in the past. When I was wrestling, they would, uh, our coach would have us do conditioning by running. The gym was in the shape of an L. So you'd run down the hall, down the stairs, down the lower L, back up the stairs, and then back to the starting point. And you had to finish in an amount of time. I can't remember how long. And if you didn't finish it, you had to do another one. And if you were the like overweight slow kid, then you were never going to finish that. So one of my biggest like associations with running until recently is just making other people have to run more. And if that is your connection, you're probably not going to like it. And I'm still not going to say it's like my 100% favorite all-time thing, but I genuinely like it now. Like I get to disappear in the woods and go run and it's fun. I had a great run. I had three great runs this week. And I'm proud that I'm about to do this thing in a month and I've tried to celebrate every little win along the way because if I didn't it's just hard like some runs are hard some are bad you're gonna have a bad run because it's hard work and if we're going to like find the nuance here I typically speak to like ultra runners and people who are down to work really hard which is why a lot of my message is dial it back and do less work better. But if I'm talking to, you know, most of everyone, then it's just go do something. The same message for the ultra running community is not the message that I would give to the general populace of America. It doesn't apply to the person who hasn't exercised in three years. But it should also be a note to that person that you don't have to kill yourself to get in shape. And in fact, if you do kill yourself in the beginning, you're probably going to hit fewer if any of your goals because you're going to either get hurt or burnt out and that is the thing that we can all take set the big goal have that motivating factor go big but like take the progress along the way for what it is and appreciate it in general this like lack of nuance and lack of personalization has led to so many problems for so many people one thing i see a lot warm-ups like i see so many videos of people on like instagram or tiktok or whatever like do this warm-up and start running better and let's talk about what a warm-up should do i actually hate the term warm-up uh warming up is important it should be a part of your prep work like you should take the first five to 20 depending on you and your history and age and etc kind of easy to get blood flowing and get your body temp up But when it comes to muscle engagement, I actually really prefer the term priming because you are trying to prime your muscles, like you're priming a pump or whatever, um, to do the work that they're about to do, to do a better version of the work that they're about to do. If you have certain muscle tendencies, as most of us do by the time we're an adult, then certain muscles are a little more dominant and others are a little less dominant and things probably just don't work evenly. So this is what your warm-up or priming session or prep session or whatever you want to call it should do. It should get you ready to run better. And we will often hear about things like stretching. Stretching is a fantastic example of something that can be very good for some people before you run and terrible for others. And there is a big thing in the like fitness community where we talk about how static stretching before exercise leads to negative outcomes or whatever and while that is very true 
in studies and probably true kind of across the board depending what kind of stretching you're doing it can be super helpful for certain people for example if your ankle flexion is so bad that you can't actually push off behind you when you run then you are not actually going to be able to drive behind you with your glute you're going to do nothing but drive through your calf right or your foot and this is going to like foster things like calf strains and plantar fasciitis etc so if your ankle flexion is really bad then maybe we should spend some time in the beginning or like right before your run doing something like a combat stretch to help increase your ankle flexion if we are really tight in let's use myself as an example i'm really tight in my piriformis specifically my right piriformis my left fine my right <laughs> really tight so before i run i do better if i actually do a little bit of static stretching of my piriformis specifically my right side i do both because it feels nice but my right side i focus on while that might be contraindicated depending on certain studies you read, it helps me because I'm really tight in that muscle. And without that, I pull things. I don't have the glute activation I need because other things are trying to take over, right? Some people, it's your hips. If you don't have the hip flexion, uh, for most people, a couch stretch, something that stretches your quad, is very good for you after you run for some people, if you are so tight in your quad that you can't get 10 to 15 degrees of, degrees of extension behind you in your quad, you should stretch that before you go run because you're not going to be able to actually drive backward and use your glute. You're just going to be like driving through hip flexors for 50 miles. So we need to know what you need in order to get better. And then there's muscle activation. Take stretching aside, right? Like, let's just look at something very simple. Your glute med, your butt muscle on the side, or your glute max, the big butt muscle down the middle, next to your crack. And the glute max should be a very large driver for you when running. And especially if we're going uphill, like it should be this nice forward, quote, mat minored and like push with the tush, or minor put which push with the tush right like your butt should be the big driver when you're running but when we see warm-ups for runners there's often stuff like band walks or clamshells and the reason for that is that a lot of runners due to so much running are stronger in their glute max and their glute mead like doesn't do its job as a result you have like the knee wanting to cave in, right? Like if we're looking at knees, they're coming in this way. It's called knee valgus, and it's a great way to get hurt. So, so if you, we look at a squat assessment and your knees go inward, then we probably do want to prime your glute med so that it's ready to do its job. It might also be an issue with your abductors, like the things that pull your leg out, but this would be a really good piece of work for you if your knees like to go valgus. For me, I have no issue with that. I played like sideways sprinting sports for years. As a result, my glute med loves to take over and my glute max doesn't like to do its job. So for me, I warm up by doing single leg elevated glute bridges. I put my foot on the coffee table and bridge up like 10 to 15 per side. And then I do the piriformis stretch and I do it again. And once we have two rounds of that, I get out the door and take the first 10 minutes easy. But that wouldn't necessarily be a good warm-up for everybody watching this. It is a good warm-up for me because personalization matters, right? Like this is a thing that we should know how to do. And the personalization problem is everywhere. Strength training is a big thing. Like I see a lot of strength, strength programs for runners and they're fine, but you know, they don't take you into account. And we see the same problems of warming up. Like our strength work should be, yes, making you stronger. Being stronger helps you be healthier longer. All great things. But if we're looking at making you a better runner, it should help fill in your deficiencies as a runner. And it just depends on your background. If we're going to go back to the glute med versus glute max thing, if your glute med's really weak, you should do a bunch of sumo squats. Toes out, knees out, everything in line, get down, push your butt back, lift up, try to crack a walnut at the top with your butt, and you are gonna find your glute med very easily. 
Now, if your glute max is the problem, we should do things like hip thrusts, whether it be with a barbell or like a booty builder machine or even at home, just the exact same bridge I talked about earlier, except I'd go from coffee table to like sofa air or sofa arm just to make sure that I'm like going heavier. This is where our strength should fill in our gaps or our problems. Run programming should also be personalized. Like you might benefit from improving your VO2 max. You might not. And when that should fit in your program, it kind of depends on how far out you are from your race and what your priorities are. How much time do you have is the real question. And then the real kicker is the longer you wait to start to figure this out, the less personalized you have the time to be, which is backwards because if you have six weeks, all of them have to count. And it's very hard to justify taking one week to get testing metrics. You might have the worst VO2 max of all runners in the world, but I'm not going to take what take to what amounts to like a couple days to test it because if you have six weeks to make the everything count, I, we barely have four weeks before your taper, right? So like if we're going to take an entire week to test it, that's really hard to justify. Instead, it is much better to take the gamble of just like stacking volume and getting you ready for race prep. So start earlier, <laughs> appreciate the nuance, and try to figure out how to personalize to you. And for most people, unless you are one of the watchers from Australia or those in Arizona and Texas who tend to run through the winter because summer is an atrocity, you should be focusing pretty hard for the next couple months of maintaining aerobic fitness and getting stronger. And this is also a great thing through the holidays because most of us like to eat a bunch of food in the holidays. There is protein abound. Yes, there's also cookies, but there's like turkey and roast beef and other things that we eat in the holidays. So let's focus a little bit on strength training for the next two months. And we can continue to build aerobic base or continue to like maintain aerobic base, run 20 to 40 miles per week, depending on what your life is and lift heavy things. And then once we get back to new year, you'll be much better able to look at the next running season world. That is why I'm releasing, finally, strength programs. I know I said that a couple months ago, but then immediately after that, and it's been a series of job interviews for a job I thankfully got, but it wrecked my entire schedule. This time, it's actually happening. They are written, they just need to have a bunch of video links put into them and be made a little less ugly, and they should be out by the end of next week. So multiple strength programs of multiple styles, from body weight to full gym to suspension trainer to what have you. And if you need any help figuring out what might be a good fit for you, shoot me a message. As always, that's what I'm here for. In the meantime, thank you for hanging out around here. I appreciate the like willingness to listen to me rant about nuance and personalization. And we'll be back next week with another one of these, very likely at 6.30 Mountain, because I keep missing the 6 p.m. start time. So I hope you all have a great rest of your night, and I will see you next week. Thank you for listening to the show. To be clear, I'm not a doctor nor a registered dietitian, and nothing you heard was medical advice. You should always speak with a qualified medical professional before making any changes to your training regimen. If you enjoy the podcast or found it useful, please take a couple seconds to give it a rating or share it with a friend. Every little bit helps. And if you want more of this information, Please head to the Trail and Ultra Running Nutrition Group on Facebook. You'll be in good company with other like-minded people who like to do hard stuff outside.